Today on The Matt Wall Show, I'll explain why no competent, responsible parent, especially of young children, can vote Democrat. I just don't see how it's possible. Also, five headlines, including California's attempts to tell their residents how many family members they can have over for Thanksgiving, where on their property they can meet with them, and how long they can stay together. All of that, uh, the uh, California government thinks it can, it can tell its residents, plus our daily cancellation and uh, much more. All of that coming up. But first, Let's talk about our, our good friends at rockauto.com. With, with the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it's now basically impossible to stock all the parts you need in the traditional chain storefront. So what's the point of enduring these uh, seemingly intimidating questions and everything while you wait, while the, ca- the guy behind the counter orders the parts on his computer, you know, choosing the only brand his warehouse happens to carry, because that's the only option you have. You have computers and phones with access to rockauto.com. So just go there. One reason to repair and maintain your cars is to save money, of course, um, that you can then use for other important things like mortgage or food. Why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, 100% more sometimes for the exact same auto parts at a chain store or a new car dealership? The rockauto.com catalog is unique. It's extremely easy to navigate, so easy that even I can do it quickly. You can see all the parts available for your vehicle. You can choose the brands, the specifications, the prices you prefer. You do all of that, just a couple clicks, it's done. Best of all, prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low, and they're the same no matter who you are. So why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? There's no reason to. Go to rockauto.com right now, see all the parts available for your car or truck, and remember to write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that uh, I'm the one who sent you there. Okay, the website... Pink News recently published a video of uh, a young boy named CJ who calls himself gender creative, has decided that, quote, gender is over and now enjoys the distinction of being the youngest grand marshal in the history of gay pride parades. Here's uh, some of that video. Watch. Are we ready? Yeah. We're ready. We're ready for pride. Hi, I'm CJ Duran. I'm 13 years old and I'm gender creative. My gender identity is male and my gender expression is female. I'm not, I've been gender creative my whole life, but this is just who I am. To me, gender is over. We don't really need it. Like, it's kind of unnecessary. I'm in middle school now, but in my old school, elementary school, I changed it so PE wasn't separated between boys and girls, and I changed the dress code for 26 schools so it wasn't separated between boys' clothes and girls' clothes. I am currently the youngest Grand Marshal in Pride history. I was Grand Marshal for OC Pride. It was really magical. It felt really powerful and like a dream. And it's really cool to be kind of like a leader. It's very important for young kids to see that there's kids like them. So it's really awesome that I was able to be the Grand Marshal and they can see me and know that they're not alone. It's no surprise that young CJ has parents who, quote, support him. And by support, we mean that his parents have worked very hard to inculcate the confusion, the lack of identity from which the child currently suffers. A few years ago, his dad marched with him in a pride parade. Uh, There's a picture of that. He's carrying a sign that reads, my son wears dresses and makeup. Get over it. It is one of the more demented forms of child abuse to dress your son in girl clothes and then literally march him through the street to show him off like he's some sort of trophy. But this, and this, is, this is how these types of parents view their kids as trophies to show off their own wokeness. But this is, this is a type of child abuse that we are supposed to accept, more than accept, celebrate, applaud, even emulate. And it's a form of child abuse categorically supported and encouraged by one of the major political parties in this country. What used to be the agenda of the fringe, radical, far-left, LGBT uh, movement has now become a mainstream feature of the Democrat Party platform. One of its most visible standard bearers, Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, recently promoted a charity that helps children, quote, transition into a new gender. She also expressed her approval of uh, this video, which shows a drag queen performing for a two-year-old. You can see it right here. And, and look at the father there, if you can call him that, a father. I don't think he really can, but brought, he brought his two-year-old son to a drag queen brunch. This is the Democrat Party. This is what the Democrat Party is. There might not be any video that better encapsulates what the Democrat Party is. A drag queen dancing for a two-year-old. And this goes all the way to the top. Joe Biden, at a town hall two weeks ago, endorsed the idea that an eight-year-old male might really be a girl trapped in a boy's body. Every elected Democrat believes this now or pretends to believe it and intends to use the school system and the media and Hollywood and whatever other tools that they have at their disposal to brainwash you and especially your child into the same belief. 
This is just one area, one extremely significant area, where the Democrat Party has positioned itself as a threat to children and families. It would be reason enough, this alone, for any competent and loving parent to never vote Democrat. But as the infomercial salesman says, there's more, much more. This is, after all, the most anti-child, anti-family political party in American history. The defund the police movement is an integral part of their campaign to make families less safe, less stable. There's a reason why you mostly see, see a lot of young, childless, very stupid people marching through the streets with defund the police banners and signs. No parent wants to live in a community without police. No family man, when he's considering relocating his family, tries to find a community where the police have fewer resources, less funding, are less likely to respond to emergencies. Parents want police to be a phone call away, not social workers. The defund the police movement is anti-family, and so it's no surprise to find it promoted by Black Lives Matter, uh, a group that has announced its intentions to destabilize the nuclear family. In the realm of education, the attacks on school choice, the war on homeschooling, all of this comes from the Democrat Party. It wants your child in his local public school, nowhere else, or maybe not in it right now, but in his room, in Zoom meetings with his public school teachers, wherever he is, the point is that you ought to have fewer education options and less of a say over what your child is taught. That's the Democrat Party's perspective. The left is suspicious of families, jealous of the influence parents have over their children, and intends quite explicitly to interfere with, undermine, and finally subvert that influence. From the perspective of a Democrat, your child belongs first and foremost to the state. And all of the most essential work of child raising should be done by the state. It's the state's job to mold and shape your child and instill the, quote, correct values into his mind. Now, some Democrats will say this outright. Others will be more circumspect. But this is how almost all of them feel. If you're a parent of a boy, the assault is even worse. The Democrat Party believes that young boys, especially white, young white boys, must be deprogrammed of their toxic masculinity, reshaped into something more acceptable for our enlightened society. In some cases, as we've seen, they seek to literally turn boys into girls, and they do believe that such a thing is possible in a literal sense. But for all boys, the goal is to demasculize, demasculinize, to feminize. And as I list the, 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 you know, the, the assaults on the, the family and, and, and children, of course, we haven't even mentioned the fact that the Democrat Party supports the murder of children at the earliest stages of life. They reject the idea that children at their youngest ages can make any legitimate moral claims for themselves or have any right to exist whatsoever. Democrats celebrate the slaughter of 60 million children. And increasingly, we hear Democrats, such as the governor of Virginia, advocating the murder of born infants as well as unborn infants. As I said, the modern Democrat Party is the most anti-family, anti-child political party that has ever existed in this country. I don't see how any parent who is competent and informed and responsible could possibly vote to put these people in power. But those qualifiers, unfortunately, competent, informed, responsible, excludes a large number of parents, which explains the Democrat Party's political success and why it remains a clear and present danger to all families and all children in this country. Let's get to our five headlines. Okay, number one here from the Daily Wire. Um, law enforcement officials in Philadelphia have reportedly launched an investigation into a vehicle that was discovered containing explosives and suspicious items which comes as the city is rocked by left-wing anti-police riots and widespread uh, looting. ABC6 reported Action News has learned that police recovered propane tanks, torches, and possible dynamite sticks from this van. The bomb squad is on the scene at this hour. City officials say at least 200 businesses, many of them already struggling in the midst of the pandemic, were the targets of massive looting across the city over the last uh, couple of nights. To assist police, an undetermined number of Pennsylvania National Guard troops will soon be arriving in the city. Well, we haven't seen them yet. Uh, or at least we hadn't seen it. Through the first two, two nights of, of rioting, we didn't see any National Guard. Um, and very few police, actually, out there, too. Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney slammed those who were looting and rioting, saying that the destruction of property will not be allowed. <laughs> well, it's already been allowed. We just got through 200 businesses that have been targeted. 
We're not going to allow you people to do what you've already done and continue to do. We won't allow it. Um, he said, the looting has taken place, that, takes place, that has taken place is distressing. And it's clear that many of these folks are taking advantage of the situation, harming our businesses and communities, and doing a great disservice to those who want to protest the death of Walter Wallace Jr. Well, nobody's protesting the death of Walter Wallace Jr. Uh, no one is concerned about that. That's got nothing to do with anything that's happening. Um, nor should anyone be protesting it because he was charging at police with a knife. And so there's no injustice here. There's no moral outrage. It's a sad thing anytime someone dies. It's not a moral outrage, though. No, no, nothing, nothing illegal or unlawful or unjust took place. Um, and then he continues from there. So he, he, um, he calls it distressing. Great. Very c- coming down really hard on them. This is very distressing. I'm very distressed by this. You know, reading this, it, it reminds you, actually, in some ways, how amazing it really is that the rioting has not, for the most part, escalated so far into larger scale terrorist attacks like bombings. Now, this is all terrorism, in my view. Black Lives Matter, domestic terrorist organization, I think they would fit that categorization to a, to a T. But and this is politically motivated violence. And the leaders of Black Lives Matter, the people out in the streets, they're, they're pretty explicit about that if you listen to them. But in terms of large-scale attacks like bombings, we haven't seen that yet. Not yet. Though it seems like from this, it's trending this way. And I can tell you that if more Democrats are put in power, uh, people who coddle these domestic terrorists encourage them give them room to destroy, in the immortal words of the former mayor of Baltimore, we're going to see that escalation. Because bad guys, they'll do whatever you allow them to do. You sit back and let them loot, they'll loot. Give them even more liberty to commit crimes and more violent crimes, they'll do that too. Number two, here's a story from a few days ago that I haven't had a chance to talk about until now, but I can't, uh, but I have to talk about it. I can't just let this one be. Article in Newsweek, it says, ahead of Thanksgiving next month, California Governor Gavin Newsom and the California Department of Public Health released new safety guidelines for all private gatherings amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The new rules come with strict restrictions that aim to help reduce the the risk of spreading infection. Um, And uh, here's what the statement says from the CDPH, the California Department of Public Health. Gatherings are defined as social situations that bring people together from different households at the same time in a single space or place. Well, that's good. Thank you for defining gatherings for us. All gatherings must include no more than three households, including hosts and guests, and must be held outdoors, lasting for two hours or less. The longer the duration, the risk of transmission increases. Gatherings that occur outdoors are significantly safer than indoor gatherings. All gatherings must be held outside. Attendees may go inside to use restrooms. Very merciful. I thank you for that. I mean, they could be telling us to go just pee in our, in our, in, you know, if you're visiting your, your uh, in-laws or something, they could tell you to go pee in the bushes. And, but no, they're allowing you to go inside. So thank you so much to our benevolent rulers. I, 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 am, I am so grateful. Uh, so you maybe go, go in to use the restroom. The new rules state that those at the gathering may remove their face coverings briefly to eat or drink as long as they stay at least six feet away from everyone outside their own household and put their face covering back on as soon as they are done with the activity. Uh, it also mentions that now that, uh, of course, no singing or shouting or any other form of loud communication will be allowed. So Democrats in California, talk about, talk about the war on family. I could have included this. I was saving it for here. Um, they are telling you how many of your own family members you can have at your home, where on your property you're allowed to meet with them, how long you may be with them, what you may do together while, while you are with them, and also that you have to wear a mask. You, you can lift it up to take a drink, but make sure you're six feet away. So every time you want to take a drink, you have to run away from everybody, lift up your mask, take the drink, and then go back. This is uh, this is almost unbelievable. I I have to tell you, when I first saw this online, I I'm not even saying this to be funny. I really thought it might be a parody. I thought because someone had screenshotted some of the the stuff, like some of the the um, 
uh, some of the passages from this article. And I think that's how I first saw it on Twitter. And I, I, I really thought it was from Babylon B. But no, this is very real. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying, should go without saying, they have absolutely no authority to do this at all. They have no authority and no power, no legitimate power to tell you uh, how many family members you can have at your own house. I mean, the, the, the California Department of Public Health, what the hell authority do you have to, to make these decisions for me and what I can do in my own home? Number three, if you needed more reasons to not support the Girl Scouts, aside from the fact that their cookies taste like graham crackers that have been sitting in your grandmother's pantry since 1987, aside from that, Here's another one. The Girl Scouts tweeted this yesterday, a note of congratulations to Amy Coney Barrett for becoming the fifth woman appointed to the Supreme Court. Now, that's not the reason to not support them. That's fine. Okay? That's a, you know, very nonpartisan. It's a tweet saying congratulations. There's a picture of all five women that have been uh, appointed to the Supreme Court. And uh, that's it. Non-political, nonpartisan. Fine. But leftists, of course, were upset about this. Because any, any positive acknowledgement of Amy Coney Barrett or any other conservative, is verboten, is anathema, uh, heretical. You can't do it. They can't stomach it. They can't allow it. So they ganged up and, and bullied the Girl Scouts into deleting and essentially apologizing for this post and saying that, uh, you know, it was a mistake to put it up because they didn't want to be political. They weren't trying to be political. They're a non-political organization. But then, shocker of shockers here, Girl Scouts have tweeted in the past congratulating liberal female Supreme Court justices like Sonia Sotomayor and those tweets are still up. So those apparently are not political. It becomes political all of a sudden when you're congratulating a conservative. Right. So what are the Girl Scouts teaching girls here? What's the lesson? They're teaching girls to cave to peer pressure, back down to the mob, apologize for doing things that aren't wrong just because it made someone's tummy hurt and they complained about it, um, and conform to the crowd. That's, that's what they're being taught. Basically, all of the exactly wrong sorts of lessons. That's what you get from the Girl Scouts. Number four, I'm going to show you something. Speaking of things that seem like a joke at first, I'm going to show you this. This is 100% real, I assure you. Uh, but with no setup, here it is without context. Watch. As of today, there have been 38,160 cases of COVID-19 in Oregon, with 390 new cases being reported today. Sadly, we are also reporting three deaths today, bringing the statewide total for COVID-19 related deaths to 608. Now, for those listening to the podcast, the audio probably didn't sound too bad. You're probably listening to that thing. Okay, what's the problem? Um, it sounded like maybe some kind of health official announcing COVID daily death numbers, which is what it was. That's a senior official with the Oregon Health Authority making this announcement about COVID. Problem, and what you can't see if you're only listening, is that the woman is actually wearing clown makeup. She is dressed like a clown to tell us who died from COVID. This was apparently supposed to be some sort of Halloween thing, okay? But that's not an excuse. I mean, just because it's gonna be Halloween soon, that doesn't mean you could just wear a costume anytime you want, regardless of the circumstance. How would you feel if you were going in for heart surgery and your heart surgeon, right before you went under from the, the uh, anesthesia, you, you see your heart surgeon coming in dressed like Freddy Krueger to celebrate the occasion? What? It's, it's Halloween. Relax. Or what if you uh, went to identify a relative's remains at, at the, the coroner's office and the woman there is dressed like a sexy vampire. It's just, it's not appropriate for the occasion. And I would say co costumes really are never appropriate for adults. It never really works, but especially not in a professional context. Though, I also have to say, the fact that Oregon has literal clowns running their pandemic response does not surprise me at all. Okay, number five. Here's another um, addition to everyone's favorite genre of TikTok videos. That would be the genre of uh, women having mental breakdowns on camera over news events. A lot of these, usually this is done in the car, which I think actually explains a lot, by the way, about women drivers. That this is where they do their, their this, is, this is where they have their emotional collapses. Um, that doesn't surprise me a lot either. 
But here's something a little bit different. This is a mental breakdown in the bathtub. Uh, this is a few days old, but it's still good stuff. Still worth playing. Here it is. Check it out. <sighs> Don't mind me. I'm in the bath, but while I'm in here, I got a notification that, that uh, Amy Coney Barrett was officially confirmed to the Supreme Court. I didn't think I would be this affected by it, but I'm scared. I'm scared for me, other women. Who need help? Everyone except white men. So, um, please vote next week. Let's try to do something. You know, I see videos like this and there's this hopeful part of me that says this has to be parody. It has to be a joke. And maybe it is. I don't know. There's obviously planning and forth forethought and, and editing even that goes into this. Why would someone do this except as a joke? You're crying in a bathtub. That's humiliating. This is a humiliating, embarrassing moment in your life. Why would you intentionally document it and spread it online for others to see? If I ever cried in a bathtub, if I ever took a bath at all, I would be embarrassed. But uh, if I was crying in a bathtub, um, I, I think the last thing I would ever want to do is tell everybody about it. It would be a shameful moment that I would keep locked inside myself for my entire life, never to be spoken of to anyone, ever. So why are you putting your own embarrassing, eminently mockable moments online? This is what people do on TikTok. It's sort of like a form of, of self-cyberbullying. They're cyberbullying themselves by putting this stuff out there. It's like if you peed your pants and then immediately pulled out your phone and did a live stream Hey guys, uh, so just want to let you know, I just peed my pants. Um, yeah, a lot of pee just all over the pants. Just pretty embarrassing. Thought I should let you know. Okay, see you later. Bye. I don't, I don't understand the point. I don't see why you would do that. Um, and But we ask, who would do this except to be funny? Well, the answer is narcissists. Narcissists who think that every moment of their lives needs to be out there and observed by everyone. Who think that everything they do and everything they think and say and feel is profound and important and worthy of attention. Uh, who think that every moment of their lives, every event, is, is, is nothing more than an opportunity to gain more attention for themselves. Those are the kinds of people who do this. Just total narcissists. And there are a lot of those out there, and so there are a lot of these types of videos. Number six, uh, we'll, we'll do a bonus number six here, finally, bonus content. I want to show you a video made by some friends of ours. Uh, I think this kind of shows you what we're up against. Ch check it out. <laughs> said you can give me anything. What you looking for, man? Maybe this ain't a typical request. Look, bro. I can get whatever you need. Guns, drugs, women. You a gambling man? You like that hard stuff? You need somebody to go away? Look, you got cash? I'll make things happen. Baby parts. What'd you say? You heard me. Unborn human baby parts. Sicko. I thought you can get anything. What'd it look like to you? Planned Parenthood? You know, it's a joke, but it's, it's not at the same time. This is what Planned Parenthood does and was caught doing. And yet half a billion dollars, half a billion dollars every year from the taxpayer. And it does almost still shock me, almost, that these people were caught on tape. And the tapes are still there. You can see them on YouTube. Selling human body parts. The body parts of babies on tape, laughing about it. We saw these videos. Not deceptively edited, by the way. That's a myth. That's a lie. Planned Parenthood did their own forensic analysis of those tapes that were done by Dave Daleiden in the Center for Medical Progress, and they themselves admitted that they were not substantially edited in any way that's manipulative or deceptive. They admitted that in their own report. Go look that up too. 
And so this is all on tape, and yet uh, nobody talks about it anymore. Like it never happened. And still, the half a billion dollars keeps funneling every year from your pockets into theirs with no sign of stopping. If it didn't stop with a Democrat Congress, or a, rather a Republican Congress and a Republican president, it's not ever going to stop. Okay, let's get to our daily cancellation. Today for our daily cancellation, I fear uh, I may have trouble containing my emotions as we discuss this topic. Uh, this is the kind of thing I might cry in a bathtub over because I have to cancel beard shamers. Somehow in the year 2020, beard shaming still exists. Anti-beard bigotry is real. It's serious. It's perhaps the, the greatest human rights crisis of our time, you could argue. Jack Dorsey, the supreme leader of Twitter, was questioned by a, a Senate committee yesterday, along with Mark Zuckerberg, other tech CEOs, over their censorship of content on their platforms. Now, I was planning to talk about the hearing itself, maybe do a, a cancellation of Jack Dorsey, Though that does seem unnecessary after Ted Cruz had his way with him. Uh, let's, let's listen to a little bit of that. Today, I want to focus my questioning on Mr. Dorsey and on Twitter. Because of the three players before us, I think Twitter's conduct has by far been the most egregious. Mr. Dorsey, does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? No. You don't believe Twitter has any ability to influence elections? No, we are one part of a spectrum of communication channels that people have. So you're testified to this committee right now that, that, that Twitter, when it silences people, when it censors people, when it blocks political speech, that has no impact on elections? People, people have choice of other communication channels with which... Not if, not if they don't hear information. If you don't think you have the power to influence elections, why do you block anything? Uh, well, we have policies that are focused on making sure that more voices on the platform are possible. We see a lot of abuse and harassment, which ends up silencing people and having them leave from the platform. All right, Mr. Dorsey, I find your opening questions, your opening answers absurd on their face. Yeah, so Ted Cruz kind of nails him to the wall there, which is nice to see. None of this has anything to do, by the way, with the cancellation, really. But uh, I think it's 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 interesting, and so let, let's listen to. So you heard that. Let's listen to the next line of questioning, anyway, and then we'll get to the daily cancellation. Why did Twitter make the decision to censor the New York Post? Uh, we had a hack materials policy um, that we. When was that policy of, adopted? Uh, in 2018, I believe. In 2018, go ahead. What was what, what was the policy? So the policy is around um, limiting the spread of materials. Uh, that are hacked. Um, we didn't want Twitter to be a distributor for hack materials. Um, we found that the New York Post, because it showed the direct materials, screenshots of the direct materials, and it was unclear how those were attained, that it felt that it fell under this policy. Now, we, so in your view, if it's unclear the source of, uh, of a document, and in this instance, the New York Post documented what it said the source was, which it said it was a, uh, a laptop owned by Hunter Biden that had been turned into a re re repair store. So they weren't hiding what they claimed to be the source. Is it, is it your position that Twitter, when you can't tell the source, blocks blocks press stories? No, not at all. Um, we our, our team made a fast decision. Uh, the enforcement action, however, of blocking URLs, both in tweets and uh, in DM, in direct messages, we believe was incorrect. And we changed it. Today, right hours. now, the New York Post is still blocked from tweeting two weeks later. Yes, they have to log into their account, which they can do at this minute, delete the original tweet, which fell under our original enforcement actions, and they can tweet the exact same material and the exact same article, and it would go through. Right, well, that's, that's nonsense, of course. The New York Post was still blocked for days, even though the reason for the block was admitted to be wrong. But rather than just let them back on the platform, Twitter wanted them to delete the tweet, which there was nothing wrong with, uh, and didn't violate any rules, and then post it again. None of this makes any sense. It's also quite beside the point. Because I'm not focused on issues like censorship, the First Amendment, monopolies, big tech manipulation of the public discourse, uh, or anything like that. To me, the big issue here is the beard that Jack Dorsey was sporting in that video. It was a long, bold, elaborate, extensive beard. 
a beard that is not ashamed of itself, not ashamed to announce itself to the world. And though I don't like anything else about Jack Dorsey, I respect that beard, as I respect all beards. The same cannot be said for much of social media, which spent yesterday mocking Dorsey for his beard, saying the most hateful and bigoted and, frankly, hurtful things. And yes, it's true that if you wanted to, you could make an argument that Dorsey looks like a homeless wizard or bin Laden's albino cousin or an out-of-work pirate or a down-on-his-luck Old Testament prophet or the decayed remains of a Civil War general or Tom Hanks if he'd stayed on the island for another 45 years. You could make all those arguments. You could say all of that if you wanted to, and many people have. I will not say any of that, though, because I do not condone such insults. Because a man has a constitutional right to grow a beard. And any who exercise that right ought to be congratulated for that noble undertaking. You want to make fun of Jack Dorsey for the nose ring, the nose ring he was also wearing? Absolutely, that's fine. Indeed, it is your duty as an American to make fun of men who wear nose rings. But the beard is off limits. A man's beard is an outward expression of the masculine light within him. Each follicle, as it sprouts forth and reaches for the sunlight, deserves to be loved and celebrated for its own sake. If you wish to shame a man for something beard-related, shame him for not having one. Shame him for being a grown man with a schoolboy's chin. Beardless men are absurd, ridiculous. When I see beardless men, I react much like I react to the sight of a three-legged dog. I sort of gawk and stifle laughter, but then also I feel pity for this poor, wretched, deficient, embarrassing thing. And yet, many beardless men have testified before Senate committees without a word of mockery. Even yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg, with the smooth face of a large infant, testified. And not one person pointed and laughed at him. This is all backwards. As always, my problem is not that we are mocking people, but that we're mocking the wrong people for the wrong reasons. And it is this upside-down and backwards way of thinking that has led, you could argue, to many of the worst tragedies in recent history. I want you to think about this. It has been over a century since we have had a president with facial hair. Even longer since a full beard has been in the White House. In the interim, there have been two world wars, a cold war, a depression, multiple recessions, multiple pandemics, thousands of plane crashes. What is this, a coincidence? We stop electing bearded men and suddenly the world explodes and you don't see a connection? Give me a break. Don't be ridiculous. Our anti-beard bias is literally killing people. How many more have to die? You ask yourself that question. In the meantime, beard shaming is canceled. How dare you? How dare all of you? Jack Dorsey does not deserve this treatment. And the very idea that you would heap abuse on this man, who is a billionaire, but evidently can't afford a comb, that's unconscionable. Combs can be very expensive these days. Who are you to judge? Let he without sin cast the first stone, as Jesus Christ himself said. And guess what Jesus had on his face? I rest my case. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me, Andrew Claven.